Welcome to the University of Maastricht program on the reform of international investment law. I am Nicolas de Sardelier. So far, we discussed a number of topics ranging from the legitimacy of ISDS to complex procedural issues. Today, we shall discuss the interactions between the substantive rights conferred to investors and the abilities of the state to regulate with the aim of defending the general interest. My guest today is Ivana Damianovic, who is a professor in camera and is a specialist of internal investment law. Welcome, Ivana Damianovic. Thank you, Nicolas. It's great to be here in Maastricht. So it's a freezing day today in Maastricht, southern Netherlands, and we shall conduct this interview inside the building of the law faculty. Yeah, let's go. These investment treaties provide investors specific protection against expropriation. By the same token, domestic system provides similar remedies. Why on earth investors uh, are favoring uh, these treaties instead of domestic law? What's the added value of these treaties? International law, of course, duly protects foreign property, and that was particularly important in the historical context, even in the period uh, after Second World War, when international investment law started its development in this post-colonial period. Mm, mm -hmm. Of course, the topic has been subject to a number of controversies. So in that second half of the 20th century, for example, the, the controversies arose around the standard for compensation for direct expropriation of a property that was nationalized. And more recently, these controversies arose around indirect expropriation and its impact on the regulatory activity of the state. You've just been mentioning uh, direct and indirect expropriation. How to draw the dividing line between these two concepts? So direct or de jure expropriation involves the formal transfer of the property title or physical possession so that the investor is fully deprived of the property. That would be the case of a municipality expropriating land in order to build a municipal road. Yes, for example. And of course this is uh, contrasted to indirect expropriation where we don't have such formal transfer of the property title, but nevertheless there is a government measure which significantly interferes with the exercise of investors' property rights. Let's imagine state authorities modify uh, land planning requirements in order to increase the size of nature, uh, nature sanctuaries and um, these new regulations curtail the rights of investors to develop industrial estates. So uh, new mining requirements, uh, new water uh, discharge requirements. Uh, will these state measures amount to indirect expropriation in your view? Yes, so they can amount to indirect expropriation, of course, depending on the effects of the case, uh, of each case. And so there the administrative measures of states could lead, lead to indirect expropriation, but also legislative measures of uh, the state. Uh, could the lawmaker uh, also expropriate in adopting legislation in favor of the general interest? Yes, so for example, uh, you, you have the decision of Germany to phase out nuclear energy, which was subject to investment claim by the Swedish investor who owned these nuclear plants. This concept of indirect expropriations has pretty much developed through the jurisprudence of investment tribunals. Nevertheless, these investment treaties do not deprive state authorities to expropriate. Of course, states have generally right to expropriate, but they have to f comply with a number of criteria. So, for example, the measure that they make has to be in the public interest, there has to be absence of uh, discrimination, there has to be due process, and of course, payment of prompt, adequate and effective compensation. <laughs> Thank you for this explanation, but to come back to my initial questions, what's the added value of such clause? 
Well, you could say that the weighing of public and private interests under domestic legal systems is more balanced in a way, recognizing the social function of property. On the other hand, tribunals more significantly take into consideration the impact of the measure on the investor. Is there any other value for the investors? Well, you could also say that the compensation and the amount of compensation under investment law could be higher than under domestic law because there is a requirement to pay, as I mentioned, a prompt, adequate and effective compensation. So due to the calculation method, this could lead to higher compensation. If I understand correctly, these investment treaties do not preclude states to expropriate. However, states can be discouraged to do so. Indeed, and scholars have been warning about the chilling effects of international investment agreements on the regulatory activity of states. That is a bit difficult to demonstrate, but I nevertheless, imagine. we can say that investment agreements remain an important tool for investors in their toolbox. And of course, regulatory chill becomes uh, an important issue in the context of climate change, for example. Which is a timely topic, of course. In relation to regular chill, a much debated clause is the fair and equitable treatment much invoked by investors before tribunals. How can you define its scope? So FET in a way serves as a catch-all provision. So investors have been relying upon it in cases where their claims have not been covered by more specific protection clauses. FET includes a number of procedural and substantive rights related to the predictability and stability of the legal framework in which they invest, their legitimate expectations, the consistency of the host state's uh, decision-making, procedural justice, so due process, uh, protection against denial of justice, uh, requirements of uh, transparency, non-discrimination. Quite an impressive list. How does FET differ from the general principle, the principe général du droit, embedded in the civil law family? So the duty to accord fair and equitable treatment to foreign investors expands to any kind of government action and all branches of the government. So administrative, judicial, um, as well as legislative. Again, uh, be it the lawmaker, be it uh, the administration, uh, the legislation or the administrative decrees uh, can be challenged on the account they are breaching this FET clause. That's right, yes. Given that there are thousand investment treaties, is the FET clause similar from one treaty to another one? Well, there are divergent formulations of the FET clause and its scope, which has raised then the question of how is the standard to be measured mm. as a minimum standard of treatment of foreigners under customary international law or as an unqualified concept. The former position means much higher threshold of liability for states, while the latter one, you could say, is more favorable to investors. Why is FET, as an unqualified concept, so favorable to foreign investors? So, as such, FET also includes the concept of legitimate expectations. So, in some instances, this has meant that investors have expectations, uh, legitimate expectations, that the regulatory framework in which they invest remains stable and predictable. Uh, while in other instances this has referred to more specific promises or representations that have been made to an investor which have been breached by the whole state. If I understand correctly, there are significant divergence in the case law of these tribunals. In, in addition, it occurs to me that the domestic courts do interpret legitimate expectations much more narrowly than these investment tribunals. Am I correct? Indeed, the interpretation of the FET clause is a good example of inconsistencies in the case law of international investment tribunals. 
and as you pointed out, it also demonstrates the differences in the scope of the legitimate expectation protections under domestic law and international law. So recently, as you would know, we have had a number of cases under the Energy Charter Treaty related to the legislative changes of the framework for investment in renewable energy in Spain, which have also uh, led to these divergences. Yeah, in addition, one could mention also the Italian case adjudicated by the Court of Justice of the European Union regarding the, uh, the fact that uh, the curtailing subsidies to renewable energy did not breach the general principle of EU law related to legitimate expectations. Yes, indeed. <laughs>
thank you very much indeed for this interesting interview that took place in the Law Faculty of the University of Maastricht. Thank you.